Hi, this is Mark Reeves. I'm head of Global Strategic Partnerships at Fever, and this is One on One with ABC Partners. Hi, this is Dave Elmy of ADC Partners. When I ask you what the most dominant sports league in the U.S. is, I suspect you'd probably say the NFL. And if I asked what sports agency more or less created sports marketing, you'd probably say IMG. How about the world's biggest sportswear brand? Nike, right? And what do all these blue chip sports businesses have in common? They all hired this episode's guest, Mark Reeves, at one point or another. Throughout his career, Mark has almost unerringly been in the room where it happened. Whether it's at the start of the NFL's international strategy to place a team in London by the middle of this decade, or Nike's decision to make Colin Kaepernick the iconic face of the 30th anniversary Just Do It campaign, Mark has both been there and done that. In this episode, we talk about these and other standout moments of Mark's fascinating sports business experiences. We'll also dive into his latest ventures, including his new role as head of global partnerships for live event discovery platform Fever. And if you hear Mark's family in the background of this episode, it's only because it was 6 a.m. in Australia and everybody was getting ready for school. What can I say? The man is busy. All right, Mark, I was rolling through your LinkedIn profile. And I, and I went all the way back to the very bottom of your LinkedIn profile. And the two earliest job entries there were, you were an assistant to agents for tennis players at ProServe, and you were a legal assistant at an environmental law firm. Those are pretty distinct jobs. Um, and I'm wondering if you can go in the way back machine and think back to that moment. You had the, you had the tennis experience and then you had the environmental law experience. What was the moment when you said, you know, I'm going to choose this sports business career, maybe not the law career? Was it was it a difficult decision? No, I think in when you, you know, thank you for bringing back those memories. I think <laughs> they both taught me what I didn't want to do, yeah. to be perfectly honest. I think the great lessons, you know, I, I mean, the one probably most relevant to this is that it was the agent. I thought, like a lot of young people, I wanted to be an agent. That was the perfect way to blend the fact that I wasn't a great enough athlete to compete. It was the Jerry Maguire thing, right? Everybody kind of thought that that looked pretty cool. I will say I wanted this before Jerry Maguire and was kind of pissed off that the movie came out, that it was going <laughs> to shed the light on this career path. Now everybody wants it. I, I, I honestly, uh, that was in my mind. But I was fortunate enough, you know, it's interesting. I chose a tiny college called Kalamazoo College, largely on the fact that they, at that point, pre-internet, had the U.S. Junior Nationals. Okay. And all the agents, when the players were there, that's how they would recruit them. And I was like, great, I'm going to um... recruit the agents. So I, I went off script. It was like, I know how I'm going to get in this industry and be an agent. And so I did. I chased all the agents during the Nationals. I got them down. I ended up getting a job at ProServe, uh, interned there. And I got to learn what being an agent was. And, you know, in my mind, it was the glamorous David Falk, you know, designing yeah. Air Jordan campaigns. What I learned is that <laughs> you were it was a very different role. And, you know, and I was looking up to great guys who, you know, at that point, there were three big agencies, right? It was ProServe, yep. Advantage, evolved into Octagon, and then IMG, IMG. Right, right? Those were the three. And I, you know, these were established guys who were well known in the industry. And they were not like doing, it was not how I wanted my career to be largely because they didn't control their lives. They were absolutely at the mercy of, you know, the youngest, hottest talent or stars are there. And it was not how I saw my career going. And I saw what, you know, what their life was like. So that was the agent side, the legal side, you know, I, uh, I had actually also had another internship at uh, Wilmer Cutler, which was became Wilmer Hale, another big firm. And mm-hmm. the, you know, I thought maybe the law side would be a softer version, environmental, nicer firm, a little more boutique. Yep. Still not what I wanted to do every day, right? I mean, it was just like, wow, no matter how much money or lucrative this is, it's not something that I enjoy. That is not the first and, time I've heard that from somebody with a law, a law degree, practicing a little yeah. bit of law and going, uh, maybe yeah. no. And I get asked a lot by young students if you need it, if you and you know, it really helps me 
in a lot of ways. And I do a lot of in-house lawyering, you know, literally for our in-house, you know, whatever thing. So I, yep. I feel empowered that I know yep. all of it. Right. And I think the law lawyers have a monopoly on knowing what everyone should know. And very few people do. You're and never so, going to be disappointed for having gotten right. a law degree. Right. But whether or not you want to practice law. And my mom was really proud of it. Right? And so, <laughs> you, know, Which you can't put a but, price on that. <laughs> on that but no but but it really helped shape like okay within this vertical of sport business yep. helped me kind of get more focused on where i could contribute where i saw a career path for myself um even if i may not have fully articulated that at the time yeah yeah okay so you have this fork in the road you say you know what I'm going to put the foot more down towards the sports business side and so you you work briefly i think for the saints you're keeping that because you, know, you did your two your law degree was at Tulane, so you kept the New Orleans connection, uh, and then you kind of went over to the league's office. And you have this kind of fascinating role there. I want to tease out from you a little bit because you were the NFL's first international commercial director, right? And that was marketing the league outside the U.S., which has yeah. traditionally not been an easy job. So I want, if you can, think back to that time. You know, and now with five games being played outside the U.S. now and the idea of a team in London being discussed, it really seems like football's kind of beginning to take the first major steps towards being an international sport. Okay. So what makes the NFL so tricky to market overseas? And what did you do that sort of laid the seeds for the success that they're now experiencing? What do you think? Yeah, it's great. And it's great to see all the attention and the success that they're having in growing the markets. I'll say that I think they've done a fantastic job. Mm. Um, and it's a tough one to your Yeah, it is tough. Your, yeah, when I started, right, it was really a reset of like, okay, let's get focused on how are we really going to expand internationally mm -hmm. with, a, with a proper strategy and had a great leader, a guy named Chris Parsons. And, you know, day one, I was introduced to the job, which was we want to make it so that London could potentially host an NFL team, you know, and have an NFL team by 2020 to 2022. So this was in 2010. So 10 to 12 years, they were like, can we work and can we build a marketplace that could theoretically have an NFL team existing? So that was like, the end goal even at that point. Yes. Oh, that's, yes. Fasc oh, that's fascinating. That, that, that was, so that was what I was greeted with, literally. And, and you know, what, up in that, till that point, there hadn't been a proper strategy yeah. as to how we were going to get there. There were markets doing desperate things. Mm -hmm. And so it was the first time they had basically, I think maybe since the days of Don Garber <laughs> running international, they had pulled everything back and said, we're going to set a central brain trust spine mm -hmm. at the center. They still have offices in the markets but that we have cohesion, we have consistency. And that was cut across, how do we market it and attract new fans? How do we manage you know, sponsorships? How do we manage merchandising? So it was really kind of a, a whole new day. Is it fair to say that prior to you being there that this was going on, that it was kind of more, the approach is a bit more capricious. Let's throw a whole bunch of things about into the wall and see if we can get something to stick. And then there was a, okay, wait a minute, that's clearly not working. Let's create the spine. Um, yeah, I think they, they had had markets um, mm -hmm. that were doing different things, very mm -hmm. different. So you had little, you had leaders mm -hmm. in markets, but without cohesion, when you went to a AB InBev or, you know, kind of a Microsoft, you said, hey, we want you to support us internationally. You really couldn't get your handle on what does that mean? There's yeah. markets that maybe you might do something in Canada because that's an easy lift up, but you couldn't really kind of present, hey, this is the strategy. And this, this is, is the concept. This is where we want to be. This is what growth is going to look like and how we're going to measure it. And so, yeah, there was a, a big kind of like the owners, I think seeing the, the growth of the NBA yep. was really the, the catalyst. A bit of an eye opener for them. Find huh? their footing, mm -hmm. right? I mean, so the, the five offices we had internationally were Canada, Mexico, UK, China, Japan. You know, China obviously was creating a lot of attention at that point with, you know, David Stern's kind of focus on China as a marketplace. Yeah. And so, yeah, that really drove. So I think that that pushed the league to say, we've got to take a look at how are we going to crack this code? Because we can't just be focused on the U.S. if we're going to win favor with sponsors, media, et cetera. Do you think it's something that is a result of this our catalyst event that led to, you know, oh, okay, this is why the NFL is becoming more successful now you know, overseas, or is this 
finally just the germination of a strategy that's been building for as long as it has. I will say, if you go back, I want to say the first iPhones was 2008. Um, yep. You were seeing just a bigger globalization. Yeah. I think you were seeing you know, social media start to connect the world differently, right? Be able to kind of like be able to more seamlessly connect. You weren't reliant on mm -hmm. just broadcast TV anymore yeah. for it to be able to find and connect those fans. Or you started to have groups that were able to connect through social. So I will actually say, you know, I think social media and the advent of being able to connect one to one with what, however big that audience might be was really the change because you yeah, know, that okay. might yeah. not be big enough, right? And you know, it's interesting. One of the reasons why, even back then, I love seeing the success of Germany. We had fought internally to say Germany, when you look at the data, was actually the biggest numerical supporter fan base, right? And Everybody's so we were, eyes are on London, but you were saying Germany. We, I mean, not saying exclusively Germany, saying you yeah, yeah. can't be sleeping on Germany because if you go back to the World League, right? The World League, I think, ended up at the end of it, it was five teams and four of them were in Germany, Germany. right? <laughs> I think the Frankfurt Galaxy, yeah. the Rhine Fire, like it was clear. And there's some great, you know, documents out, documentaries out there. I just watched one um, that Christian McCaffrey executive produced about like a tiny team in a tiny mountain town in Germany Sorry. where they yeah. love football, right? I mean, but it was for whatever reason, the Germans just adopted American football as their favorite exported sport right? Or, you know, or, or imported sport rather. And so with that, you know, I like, wow, I mean, we shouldn't see the reason why that at the time the league didn't want to go after that is it didn't match the model, which was get a big media partner to pay you to subsidize the league. That was how okay, the business yeah. was run in the US. That was how it worked in the other markets. But don't think for a second that we didn't see those like trends of like, if you actually go and look at the data, the data will tell you Germany is not to be slept on and probably a, you know, a market that's worth exploring a little more deeply. I'm just going to keep my fingers crossed for the Rhine fire to make it back to the NFL, <laughs> a London franchise and the Rhine fire, because as far as names go, Rhine fire's got to be top five. Yeah. And I will say to be lucky enough to go to enough games in Europe, right, though, both Wembley and Tottenham Stadium and at one point Twickenham as well, um, you see that, right? Because it, 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 one thing that people may not know, it's not just UK fans who are now turning out, but it's also it attracts, you know, event from all over Europe. And so you would see these kind of ride fires and you'd see people breaking out everything. Now it's great. I mean, <laughs> and, but seeing the success of the German, the interest in the German market is again, I think it's fantastic. And look, the NFL will find markets where it really resonates. And, you know, it's smart to focus. It won't be global like uh, soccer is, like right. an NBA is, right? But I think it's got markets that can definitely develop and grow for sure. So that time at the NFL lasts about six years. And then you make an interesting transition. You go from one monolithic sports brand like the NFL and you go to this other tiny little company uh, called Nike where you start overseeing their football brand and I want to talk about a specific period of time in it because it's it's it, I find it to be one fascinating and how it's continued to change sport and culture and how people respond to it going forward because it is when we talk about inflection points this moment is an inflection. It's a true watershed moment in sports and culture. And that's when, of course, uh, the San Francisco 49er athlete, um, Colin Kaepernick, famously took his knee during the national anthem. Uh, and he was protesting uh, systemic injustice and police brutality. Obviously, produced a ton of controversy. And a lot of companies ran away from Kaepernick at that time, not wanting to do anything to do with that. And I think that was kind of the playbook that a lot of companies were following at that time, you know, avoid controversy, however you can, but Nike, <laughs> you, you did the opposite. You know, you, you leaned in to the idea of Kaepernick and chose him to be the 30th anniversary face of the Just Do It campaign. So with that overly long preamble, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit what it was like behind the curtain as that was all going on and how that, decision was made i can share a little if, of all the the fortunate areas of business of the sports business that i've ever been able to be involved in i think that was far and away the moments that i if i look back upon as having the most impact being one of the most uh, difficult and even just resonating the most mm. in any circles that i have ever been in 
right? So I think, yeah, really, really fortunate to be at the right place at the right time to be part of that. Yeah. Kind of, and, and I think that being even the discussions leading up to it, the adjustments, the changes, how it actually came to be. I'll, I'll share a little. There's, you know, <laughs> I got to be careful about it. All right. All right. I understand. I, 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 you know, the, I will say, and, and, I, and I mean this sincerely, the, the, my, my boss time, who was you know, effectively the CMO of North America for, for Nike, a guy named Gino Ficinati, was really the driving force behind it. I mean, mm -hmm. he, he believed in this so much. He was not somebody who was naturally an American football fan, okay. but he was a huge supporter of what Colin was doing and using the platform and using the massive media platform of the NFL to raise awareness to mm -hmm. social injustice. Right. And down to the point where you could imagine, right? And if you go back to this, the idea, and this is where I <laughs> played quite a role, of how do you navigate this with a huge partnership with the NFL? Yeah. Right? Because at that point in Nike, I had had a couple of different roles at Nike, but at that point I was leading, yeah, the American football brand, right? So all the touch points from every element, NFL. And kind of all flowed through you at that point. You were Nike's football guy. Yeah, yeah. And, and so that was where, how do we do this, <laughs> right? Without like, <laughs> yeah. you know, a huge partnership and a very public partnership. And so if you notice, right? And I mean, I'm sure people picked up on this, but there was absolutely no... NFL IP involved, right? Mm -hmm. Whatsoever. Right. And early versions when we worked with Wyden and Kennedy to build out the the creative of course had, you know, program had had images, had kind of some of the video assets from the NFL. We were like, there is no way. No way. Like, <laughs> zero, zero chance. And and look, one of it was we you know, had to share with with the NFL as good partners that something was coming. I will say we probably stalled and delayed and did not share as much as uh, <laughs> we, we could have. There was some strategic delay. Yeah, and, and, and even just getting buy-in, because one of this one went, actually, I'm not sure how many people realize this, or would know this, this one went up, instead of going through the normal channels as to how you get creative approved, which would be ultimately up to our CEO, yep. this one went off script and went to Phil. And said, oh. Phil, being chairman emeritus, will you, this is the Nike that harkens back to what made Nike, Nike. Will you bless this? Because if we've got your blessing, yes, we will gonna go say no to Phil. feel good about it. Even though your role is not what it is, he yeah. was still very much, he was still at his office. He was still around. He was still the leader. And so both, you know, he and, you know, also our ex-president, um, Elliot Hill, who's a great guy, was also very involved in saying, let's do it this way. This is how we think we can do something that is going to be threading a very thin needle and get it through that there. And, you know, it was really interesting. I mean, we were very cognizant that this was going to create controversy. You knew going how in. How much controversy, yeah. you know, I think would be hard to, to really guess, but we knew we were pushing this one. And, and I will say, just to add a little bit, word got back, this was initially supposed to launch on the Tuesday, because it was after Labor Day, right? Mm -hmm. Coming on, after Labor Day. Word was, we were supposed to launch it on the Tuesday. Once we got a word feedback that we were gonna get a lot of pushback from the league and other people at Nike, we made the decision to actually launch it on Labor Day, which would not be a day you would ever normally launch Never on a tip, yeah, exactly. Because we needed to get, so it was that black and white photo with yep. nine words. That was what we put out. And if you go back, we actually launched it very, you know, just because we had to get it out. Because we knew once we got it out, we wouldn't be able to take the whole film that was planned for a few days later out. So that was that was kind of, yeah, behind the scenes. Was very aware of the moment and what the challenges associated with that could be, right? You, you knew, like you said, you were you were threading a very small needle not a lot of room for error had to do due diligence internally to make sure internal support was there can you reflect back after things were released what the feeling inside the company was like when i mean because it really ran the gamut to people saying it might be one of the most powerful ads they've ever seen to people burning their nike sneakers on on youtube was there this we did it where we don't know what we've got we've got the tiger by the tail what was what was that moment like 
Yeah, no, it's great because even within Nike, right, a very progressive company, as you look at it, there was people on both sides of the, the argument. No, without, that. Without question, without question. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think, you know, what I think we would take pride in is that I heard from a lot of people who had been at Nike. Nike's famous for having a people who stay a long time, right? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a kind of a family knot. And a lot of people who had been there for a long time said, this reminded me of that spirit of Nike that mm. no one else had. That, that rebellious us against the world. I will say that about Nike, even at the scale of Nike today, it still, at least as long as I was there, it still very much felt like a challenger brand. Yes, no interesting. Less on anything, right? It's four times as big as Adidas, far bigger than everybody else. Still, the attitude is we haven't won anything. Is, is that something that's actively built is it just the natural ethos that kind of flows through the company or you know how do, how do you maintain that challenger brand status when you are for lack of a better term a behemoth in the industry yeah you know i think it is culturally woven i think there's there's and i'm happy to share it there's an, out there you can find phil knight's lessons for business from like i think 1979 <laughs> um and it literally talks about how the company needs to kind of like perform and think about itself. And it okay. very much has this challenger mentality. And I will mm -hmm. say it even just cultivated. There are no celebrations for good work or hitting numbers. It is like, what's next, right? It is, there is no second Hunger. place. They, they, you know, if you think about some of the famous creative that inspired a, a lot of us, right? I can still put that, that road that's, you know, right by the campus in, you know, in Beaverton, Oregon, but that empty road that a runner is running on where it says there is no finish line or there is no second place. Like that is always the goal it, you know. and it's just woven through. So yeah, I think it is cultivated carefully and I think it, it gets there and nobody, you know, no matter how good things are, I'd say we could do, you know, a massive Super Bowl execution that had all sorts of touch points, you know, hundreds of people involved and you get through and like, okay, good. Next, you know, next thing. Next. And it's not you know, hunger. Not take the time to, and I think that's just the athlete's mentality it comes from Phil. It came from what Bill Bowerman, right? And it's just always been there um, as a company. And I think it pushes everybody um, who's on the campus and connected to it. Thinking about the response to the Kaepernick campaign and, you know, some of the other things that Nike does is from a progressive standpoint. Like I mentioned earlier, you know, brands used to be really hesitant about taking positions on topics that might be considered controversial and now it seems like that's completely flipped to a certain degree brands in order to connect with audiences today have to take a stand at least in some cases you think nike was a catalyst for that do you think that that moment with kaepernick and leaning into that moment was a that catalyst for brands to think about things differently than they had or they're just larger societal things go at work here. Yeah, here, here's something that I think may not be known as widely that may give some insight in there. Mm -hmm. Nike, even though it is ubiquitous as a brand and has consumers of all age ranges, really obsessed as a young consumer. Mm -hmm. right? It always looks young. It always goes there. Right. When you looked at the data, I'm, I'm probably I'm probably not going to be in any focus. Group. I mean, we all are out of that. I, I promise. <laughs> uh, when you look at the data of what the younger generation was saying, yeah. even at that point, they were far more into brands that stood up for causes that they believed in. Mm -hmm. right? You see this big societal shift. And I'm, it excites me and empowers me for what these next generations will do um, in terms of where they spend their money, where they invest, where they support brands. So I think because we had been looking at a younger consumer, yeah. we use that to inform what we were doing. I think other companies have been doing that. They just may not have focused on that audience base as young as we did. So yep. that as they age up, that's why you're seeing it. I, I like to think it's, it may be more capitalist than you think, right? Now you see some amazing brands, right? I've always loved what Patagonia or Cotopaxi or brands that really contribute back. Mm -hmm. A lot of brands can do more. A lot of organizations can do more. Um, but 
I think the data will tell you that if you're going to be very successful for these younger generations that are coming up for Gen Z, for Gen Alpha, you better be there. I, you know, it's an overused sports analogy, but you, you skate to where the puck is going to be, not to where the puck is. And then, you know, Nike, while maybe not the most fabulously successful hockey equipment company in the world, <laughs> no. I mean, I think it absolutely no. speaks not to the Canadian. No, 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 no. That always, <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that was a short lived time when they had some Nike jerseys. Uh, very, short. very short lived. <laughs> <laughs> you got to try everything once. That's, I guess, what you have to say. Yeah, All right. Yeah, so yeah. in the course of this conversation, we've talked about your work with a number of pretty significant companies, right? You've worked with IMG, one of the companies that set what sports agency and sports and business is all about uh, the NFL, obviously the dominant uh, league, certainly in the United States, probably in the possibly in the world. Uh, Nike, uh, the, the behemoth of sportswear industry. Um, and a cultural icon in its own right. And I'm, I'm wondering that other than having you worked for them for a while, for different times, what do these companies have in common? You've been in chairs at each of these. As you think back to your time with them, what sets them apart? What makes them as successful as they are? You've alluded to a couple of things, but I'm wondering if you look at all three of them in the same kind of context, what common threads do you see? Yeah, so it, it, it's interesting, right? I mean, they're they're all different. They're all you know kind of incredibly successful. I think they they take different shapes, right? I think both IMG and Nike mm -hmm. had a very at that time, especially under McCormick, yep. had a very entrepreneurial, kind of go create an empowered worker base that basically like there was a very clear voice and a vision as to what the challenge was. And, and I will say, I feel like IMG maybe not, you know, thinking itself as a challenger brand as much, but there was always this like win mentality. Yep. It felt very athletic, right? It felt very much like, you know, we, and I think they both mm -hmm. also recruited fairly like ex-athletes. They had an athlete mentality. They, they wanted to breed that hunger, right? And I feel like that was always, there with them. I feel like my role at the NFL had that because we were trying to, as you alluded to earlier, challenge, take on the, the challenge of turning, you know, fans everywhere in the world into NFL fans. That is the uphill battle for sure. Right. I, I would say, I tell people like, even if nobody else has noticed, one twist. we've moved that boulder, <laughs> just one step up, like that's success. Right. You know, but, but it's always been, and you know, a, a kind of that challenger mentality, which is something that I, always appeals to me. I love the challenger identity. I think, you know, one of the things that I've always talked about, and this is more particularly with the NFL and Nike, is that when you break it down, I look at the NFL as the sport that wants to be a business, right? I mean, by the Park Avenue address, by the way it holds itself, it really wants to be seen as a business. Nike is a business and a far more complex business, for instance, that wants to be a sport. Right. Nike, you get down to like what the NFL is doing as a business, right? You've got games, which are not that all. You've got ticketing, you've got media, you've got consumer products. You, you, it's not that complex when you care here. Like if you're at Nike, supply chains, currencies, you know, kind of like getting, trying to scale the globe. The, the, the complexity of the business is far deeper and wider, but yet all the voice, all the way you present is through sport, right? So it's a very kind of well, like... Well, it's, it's funny, you know, the, the NFL has this such such an outsized, uh, you know, perspective in our culture, right? You forget, like, the average NFL team employs 200 people. I mean, other than the athletes, I mean, they're, they're small businesses. Yeah. That just happen to be immense from the way that we see them. Yes. And the way they're run, there's huge variance, right? I think part of the thing, again, you know, I mean... You know, NBA was the first one or the right. first notable one to create something like Teambo, right? Which was, hey, we're going to build a central group that's going to help these small businesses yeah. figure out what to do things better, right? Like a consultancy and in as consultancy, right? The NFL now has something that's like that. But, but you know, they were run very autonomously. And even now, I mean, you can look at the different 32 bit teams right. and they are run, you know, very differently. I, I'm fortunate enough to know a few of them quite well. And yeah, you see huge variants and it's really interesting, right? I've always talked about it as almost like a lemonade stand where, you know, <laughs> like, if you think about it, they're, they're doing it at very le various levels of, you know, how much data they're using, how targeted they are, how they're really focusing on serving a consumer, right? I mean, here's, here's that one thing though. I think, you know, yeah, it, it's just knowing your constituent base. I think, you know, 
Nike serves the athlete to mm -hmm. round out your question, right? And, and the way that Nike defines athlete is if you have a body, you are an athlete, right? That's what <laughs> yeah. Nike yeah. I will say the NFL league office, from my perspective, serves the owners, right? And yeah, that very much so. Constituent. And, and you, you see how that plays out. And that really is how they both obsessed and both very good at serving those target audiences. They're just very different target audiences. Right. Nike is literally 8 billion people across the surface of the planet. And the NFL is 32 people. <laughs> I mean, 31 <laughs> plus the city of Green Bay, you might argue. But, oh, okay. yes. oh, very good. Right? Absolutely. Right. So shifting gears a little bit, I think it's fair to say that most of us during COVID uh, made some changes to their lives. Um, I think you, you may have taken it to the greatest possible extreme uh, by uh, you relocated to Australia from, uh, from Portland. I'm just kind of curious. I mean, what's that adjustment been like for you and the family to move halfway around the world? Yeah, no, it's been great. Um, and I, I will say this, it's, it's, it was not by design. I give my wife the credit. My wife is Australian. And at okay. that point, if you go back in time, right, 2020, we were not, you know, with kids, you know, school, Zoom, oh, Zoom school, Zoom is not yeah. going well. And yeah. at that point, Australia had kept COVID out and we had effectively, my kids and my wife had a golden ticket to get there. Like, you know, and so if you think about it, like, okay, there's an island out there. It doesn't have COVID. We have grandparents to help with the kids. That seems like a better place. To See you later, bye. <laughs> so, so my wife actually left with the kids. And so I, and this is what actually led to my next kind of, uh, my next kind of move or phase of my next career. Next phase, yeah. Was, was that at, you know, for five months, I was just waiting for a visa. So if you imagine going back to those times, you couldn't really go anywhere. It was all on lockdown. So I was working during the day at Nike via Zoom. Yep. But then nights and weekends were totally free and I was totally bored. I was like, what am I going to do? Right. And so I started using that time to think about what do I really want to do and how can I use all this excess time that I have? And so that led to me reaching out to some friends. You know, I've always been bent towards soccer mm -hmm. um, in terms of sport right and so that led to me getting involved in a couple different soccer clubs and really using the time to say hey what if i take some of this time and apply it to a question like how would you take leeds united for instance now just into the premier league and make that into a global brand right that's a that's that's a fun challenge for me to play with and you know fortunate enough i had friends in places that'd be like yeah that'd be interesting if you wanted to do something like that and so it's so literally just calling people up and saying I've got excess cerebral power right now and I, you know, I want to use it on something. So could we do this? It, it was, it, that, that makes it sound like it was, <laughs> it was, it was, it was more, I'm going to talk to people that I miss yeah. because I'm sitting in Portland and I talk to Nike people all day and I don't get to see my friends who are all over the country who are doing things. You know, I've always been fortunate. Like a lot of people in the sports business, it's a business, but it's also a lot of friends, right? Yep. A lot of my adult friendships are all through people in the industry. Right. So it was more organic in that I'm just going to call people that I love and I love talking to and I love learning from and missing. And so of those, some of them were just catch ups and talking about how bad this, this is was and, yeah, and, yeah, learning. Yeah. and also horrible things that had happened to friends like, you know, so catching up. Some yeah. of them, though, turned in fortuitously to just different opportunities. And within that world, you know, I, I believed I had the capacity to do more because if you remember, I mean, obviously with with COVID slowing everything down still at Nike, we didn't know what the American football business, the US football business would yeah, look, like, look like, right? Because nobody was playing football. Right. So how are you going to sell shoes through Dick Sporting Goods? Like this is huge issues for the business. It's not throwing and, away the playbook. It's ripping it up, throwing it in a garbage can and burning it a couple times. Yeah. And so it meant that the normal day-to-day, day-to-day pace at Nike is really busy. It suddenly slowed down a little yeah. bit because we just couldn't do anything. You couldn't spend money on marketing campaigns. Right. If you don't know what that looks like, right? And so that was so it opened up a lot of opportunity just and capacity for me time wise, which led to just stretching out different interests and led to new things that I added on to my job just because I did have a lot of excess time. And that's led to a, a lot of kind of interesting things for you, right? Because you're now guiding and investing in all kinds of stuff, right? You know, you're on the board of directors at Relo Metrics, which is uh, a measurement company that focuses yep. on sponsorship. It's 
you're a non-executive director with Sportable. Um, yeah. you're, like you said, you're inviting leads, you, leads, uh, you cloud nine esports. So you, you've got this kind of a very cool, uh, very distributed portfolio of sports businesses. Can you talk a little bit about what catches your eye about some of the businesses that you're working with and, you know, what litmus tests maybe you use internally to say, you, that's one I want to yeah. work with. Yeah. Yeah. And I will say, yeah, no, I know. And all of those are there and they're there. And also I'll say one to mention, I'm really excited and enthusiastic about, you know, kind of one of the roles that I'm also playing now with a, a young company called Fever. And we're going to be doing more in sports as well, which I'm, okay. I'm heavily involved yeah, in. Yeah. Let's but, talk about that in a minute. But, but to answer your question, the one thing, if I look back, the one thing that I always have kind of like, almost like a moth to a flame <laughs> gone <laughs> is I love using technology to bring fans closer to what they love. Okay. I, I feel like I've always done that. I mean, down to the point where at IMG, being in Silicon Valley, right? I was you know, very early be like, hey, things like these social platforms, right? With like Facebook can be used to, at the time to leverage our athletes and our events better. And right, set up meetings with, at that point, you know, the, the names you would all know now right, came out of that with our people will be like, hey, this is a platform that we need to use to help grow this, right? I've, that, I was there, um, but then also, you know, if I think about the NFL, how do you use technology? So condensing games down, adding language, adding tutorials, right? And cutting, you know, really making it accessible because technology allows you to do. And sports has not always been the quickest moving and quickest, you know, most innovative platform, largely because you don't have to be. Fans have such an insatiable appetite. Right. People, you can mistreat them and they will keep showing up, right? right. No matter what it is. And so I have always gone towards how, where are their businesses? They're using technology to kind of to disrupt that gap. advance. And that's what excites me. And so every business that I'm involved in either is doing that or has that vision and that's what they want or, or that appetite. And I think that's where, that's what it always is for me. Right. And, you know, I mean, I, and I love learning and I love, you know, I love the other part, the global side for me, I mm -hmm. was fortunate enough, my, the, you know, what led to the NFL job was I was at, when I was at IMG when back in San Francisco, but one of our clients that I worked you know, closely with was Visa. And of course that was global scope. So we were doing the Olympics, the rugby world cup, and then ultimately the FIFA relationship. So really that opened up my world to the U S sports business is big. The global sports business is much, much bigger. Little and bit. so I've always been, if you add those data, technology, innovation, and kind of globalization, those are my two kind of great loves in the industry. And they absolutely are the thread that tie all those different pieces together, right? From esports to Relo Metrics, which is using data and AI to, to help a sponsorship measurement and things like that. That is a fascinating thread. And I think I, sus I suspect that led you to where you are now, head of global strategic partnerships for Fever. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about Fever, um, what the, how the business operates, and, and what role do you see sports? playing with that as it continues to grow and accelerate yeah it's i mean the the founders are amazing um you know i think one of the things that they took uh an idea on is how do you use data mm -hmm. to better inform live experiences much like netflix did for how we watch things on our personal screens mm -hmm. right they looked at this as like there's a huge amount of data out there that can help inform people because there's a gr amazing things going on in a live experience venue that people just don't know about. And people who are great at creating experiences aren't necessarily great at marketing or some of the other challenges, right? Ticketing, customer service, that. So how can we build a business around that? The things, you know, the company, you know, because it's not based in the US, it doesn't have as big of a profile, it's based out of Spain. So I think that's one reason why people don't know it more, but they know some of the, right. the events that it hosts, right? The Stranger Things live experience, right. Harry Potter live experiences, those ones. and so. Now, as you look at that vertical of you know TV media, the IP they've really seen, the company's really seen a lot of interest and growth in those big IPs. Another area of big IPs where people are naturally drawn to our sport. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we've started now, we just are involved to some capacity in an F1 experience 
um, that is one of the early forays into sports that's in Madrid right now. But I think you'll see more of us bringing sport, not the version that's just the game, mm -hmm. but all the areas of cultural connectivity, whether that's through social justice, like we talked about, or music or fashion or art, and how does sport inter you know, intermix with all of those. And so I think as we think about it, we're able to use data um, which is informed by, by you know, a sister company of ours that's involved secret media. So if you go to Secret San Francisco or Secret London okay. or Secret yep. New York, it's all part of the same company. We very much focus on how do we learn, you know, from data to you know to help create great experiences that people will enjoy. It's fascinating to think about, and it's such an important point too, particularly when you think about the games being played. Because you know what, the average game is going to be three hours over the course of a week, say, if you think about football or baseball, maybe four hours uh, a few times a week. There's so much content that goes on above and beyond the actual game being played. And the idea of what you can do with that content is almost limitless. I think you've probably picked a great one in F1, given the way that the sport is exploding as a result of Drive to Survive and all the things that are going along with that. But the idea that you bridged earlier about how do we get fans closer to the sport using technology, it sounds like fever is right in the middle of the bullseye for what was going to scratch an intellectual itch for you to begin with. Yeah, well, and I think, look, if you look at all the data, this is, I'm not going to share anything that isn't known out there to anybody who- No, we want the, the proprietary sport. stuff, nothing, but nothing but the yeah, proprietary yeah, yeah. stuff on this. Yeah, yeah. No, but, but look, <laughs> when you, you alluded to it, right? I, I look at the lens through my kids, right? They're not going to sit through three and a half hours of anything, right? <laughs> I, I can't even, you know, I, I just, but, but, and, and the data is showing this, the v, the traditional viewership, right? Is not how younger generations are going to consume this, but they are still paying attention. Mm -hmm. They are still watching. It's just in different manners, right? It, right it's and, changing. And look, social engagement for, you know, kind of, you know, some of the athletes leagues is far more kind of embedded than actually watching the game. So younger generations are watching, they are paying attention to these athletes, but they're not necessarily prioritizing saying it's must watch that I watch this game. You know, right. some games rise to that level of, oh, I'll pay attention, you know, but maybe not every game the way that kind of people when they didn't have as many choices, had, right? I grew up a hockey fan because in Canada, there wasn't much else. I, I was, <laughs> No, but it's now, required by like, law, Mark, in, in Canada. You have to is. be a hockey fan. It is. And today, right, I might have become, I might have followed, you know, Alfonso Davies or Jonathan David and become a soccer fan right. before I became a football fan, right? a hockey fan, right? And so I feel like the world opening up, you can now find what it is that really connects with you rather than something be a, being forced upon you, whether that was hockey or basketball or football or what it is. So I think you'll see this empowerment of, you know, fans choosing what they want to follow, choosing the athletes, choosing the teams, as opposed to, oh, because of geographic, I am born and destined to be a long suffering Toronto Maple Leafs fan. Right. I mean, no, that is, that is long mean, suffering. You know, never been in the Stanley Cup finals in my lifetime. <laughs> Not that you're been a while. Um, no, but, but that's, I mean, I think it's, you know, I mean, I don't know if people think about it that way, but the geographic landing points, right? I mean, you can walk through anywhere, right? I mean, Australia has a remarkable amount of Yankees hats. I, I still, you know, being here enough, like everywhere there are Yankees hats. It's and insidious. I've never been in New York. I've asked them, yeah. you know, but, but you see that, right? And you see kind of like, you know, whether it's, you know, the Jordan PSG jerseys all through New York or wherever it is, you know, we're changing. We are Either. not beholden to our geography or, our, or what the teams that our parents rooted for in the past. Right. And I think that goes back to what you were talking about. Technology has made rooting and fandom global and selective and uh, so much more part of an individual's experience rather than sort of the legacies that we used to adopt this. Yeah. Um, Mark Reeves, I want to say first and foremost, thanks for spending all this time with us. I feel like this could have been a volume one of many, many volumes of conversations because so many possible directions we could go. Um, and, but before I let you go, I'm going to put you into the lightning round. I've got a series of questions I'm going to ask you. Um, and I want your the quick uh, response. First thing that comes to your mind. Are you ready? 
Yes, I love this. All right, let's do this. Lightning round. Uh, your favorite piece of Australian slang? Ooh. Oh, gosh. Ah. I'll say jumper. Jumper? Jumper. It's a what? sweater. A sweater it's is a, a jumper? Okay. Yeah, a sweater is a jumper. Very good. All right. Uh, please provide a short foodie review of Vegemite. Ooh, soy sauce in a paste. Oh God, that really is okay. Uh, I mean, that that's effectively what it is. Not yeah. my favorite, but I learned to like it a little more. All right, as you mentioned earlier, you did your undergraduate at Kalamazoo College. Their fight song is "All Hail to Kazoo." Can you play it on an actual kazoo? Absolutely not. <laughs> there is a Gibson guitar, Kalamazoo guitar, though, that I find like yes, yeah, strangely attracted to. Right. Go very, fighting hornets. Very good fighting hornets. I just want a big shout out for you right there. Uh, what's the favorite pair of Nikes you have in your closet right now? Oh uh, gosh, I still love the McEnroe Air Trainer ones. I I I think Born and Brad, that was my favorite ones with the Velcro strap. Those were the ones. Those have People always can't been see my this, favorite. but your face got dreamy thinking about those Nikes. Uh, for just a second. All, right. All right, last one. You got your law degree from Tulane. Next time I get into trouble at Mardi Gras, can I call you? Oh, yeah. I, I, I don't know if I'll answer, but sure. Uh, <laughs> Depends on the trouble. <laughs> yeah. And, and by the way, roll wave. Amazing. I, kudos. To, I will say this, getting to know, I, I work closely with the uh, the Tulane Sports Law Board and wow, have they done an amazing job. Pretty cool. Football, ninth in the country. Um, I was fortunate enough to just spend a, a little time with them recently. Amazing what, what's going on there. And by the way, I will encourage any American football fans, the new stadium on Tulane's campus is a phenomenal type of stadium, is a phenomenal experience to uh, go. It, it marries football and Mardi Gras and New Orleans and everything that makes it great. So I, I would encourage everyone to go. That is about game. as good a plug as you could possibly get. Mark Reeves, thanks for the time, man. Yeah, thank you. Great to see you. Thanks for listening to this ADC Partners podcast. For more information about ADC Partners, please visit our website at adcpartners.com.